Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to today's Irene Online Seminar. Uh, my name is Thanasis Psaltis, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, I'm a postdoc at TU Darmstadt, and I represent uh, Newgrid uh, in this uh, seminar committee. Um, today, uh, before we start, let me, let me tell you that you should uh, mute your microphones. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, you should uh, write them on the chat, and hopefully we'll have time to uh, discuss them at the end of the talk. Uh, so a few things about me, uh, for those who don't know me. Uh, um, uh, my background is in experimental nuclear astrophysics, and right now I'm working in theoretical astrophysics uh, with Almud and Arcones. Uh, and it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Moritz Reichert uh, from TU Darmstadt. Uh, Moritz recently defended his PhD thesis uh, working with Alm Arcones and Camilla Hansen, and right now he's looking at uh, postdoc opportunities. Uh, Moritz has experience uh, in both uh, observational astrophysics uh, and theoretical astrophysics in terms uh, of uh, nuclear reaction network calculations um, and hydrodynamical simulations. Today he will talk to us about uh, his uh, PhD project, which was about uh, the magnetational driven supernova, which is a very exciting uh, site for the ARC process. So whenever you're ready, Moritz, please take it away. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So uh, I'm very happy to present uh, the work of my PhD thesis, uh, where I dealt with the nuclear synthesis and observational evidences of magnetorotational driven supernovae. To be more specific, I worked on the R process and europium is a trace for the R process. The R process has been shown to be hosted by neutron star merger in 2017, but when assuming neutron star merger as only source of R process elements, several problems arise. Therefore, I dealt during my PhD on another scenario that possibly could host the R process, namely magnetorotational driven supernova. To tackle the question, uh, if, if they are uh, possible hosts of the R process, uh, I tackled the question from two perspectives, namely from a stellar observation perspective, uh, but also from a theoretical nuclear synthesis uh, perspective. For the stellar observations part, I looked at 12 sorority galaxies. You can see here on the left, the Milky Way, and as a sketch, the uh, 12 galaxies satelliting around the Milky Way. For this project, uh, in total, we analyzed 380 stars that were distributed in 13 of these 12 sorority galaxies. We determined abundances of these stars uh, for 12 different elements, namely some light elements as magnesium, some iron peak elements, some uh, lighter heavy elements as strontium and yttrium, and also heavy elements as barium and europium. Uh, europium as trace for the R process and barium as trace for the S process. What do I mean by we analyze these stars? Also to be more specific, uh, you can see here on the top left uh, a spectrum of a star and you can see here these uh, absorption lines that are uh, specific to, to uh, individual elements. When we know the structure of the star determined by the so-called stellar parameters like surface gravity, effective temperature, metallicity and microturbulence, we can connect these absorption lines to an actual abundance. So here you can see, for example, uh, for the example of strontium, we can see uh, theoretical lines that we can calculate uh, and synthesize for different abundances here given in square bracket notation. When talking about abundances, uh, we have to make a definition of the abundance and we can either give it in the so-called log epsilon notation relative to hydrogen or in the square bracket notation where we subtract the value of the sun here. But when analyzing abundances, uh, there can be uh, systematic differences depending on the method that you choose. And just as an example, when you determine the temperature of a star, you could, for example, uh, make use of that it's a black body. And you have here for different temperatures, uh, the spectral energy density of a black body. And then you can connect the color of a star to its temperature. This would be one method. But you can also look at uh, certain temperature uh, sensitive lines as the H alpha line here, for example. You can see here for two different stars with two different temperatures, uh, these lines look different. Or you can actually measure individual iron lines 
and uh, each each iron line should give you the same metallicity value. And judging from this, you can you can uh, judge if you uh, took the right uh, model of your star and also the right temperature. Therefore, there are other things, other systematics that can go in. So simply by the fact that you use uh, solar abundances, for example, for the square bracket notation. But uh, then the question is, which solar abundances do you use from the literature? So here you can see basically the residual of different solar abundances. You can, uh, you also have different atomic physics input that you measure, for example, in the lab, like the oscillator strengths. And uh, if you determine the abundance, it's also one to one connected to the oscillator strengths. That means if you uh, have a difference here in point two, you will also have the difference in uh, approximately in the abundance as well. And there are other things like the choice of the atmosphere model, the choice of the absorption line itself, or other things that simply go into your calculation. When looking at dwarf galaxies, actually, there's a lot of literature uh, that you can choose and where you can get abundances from. But uh, you have to be aware from the systematic differences that I told you before. And therefore, when you compare, for example, three different things, uh, and compare it with, uh, with abundances that, that I determined in the end, you will see that the, that the average uh, residual is not always at zero. So there are offsets that are exactly these systematics. In other words, so every literature uses their method and uh, determines their, uh, their abundances in a certain way. And our goal was to basically take all the values and uh, analyze them in, the, in a homogeneous way to always hit at the same place. It's apparently pretty, pretty challenging to do so because you see here now uh, magnesium over iron in this square bracket notation and every dot is one star. Um, and you can see that the metallicity ranges from quite metal poor to, uh, to metal rich. And uh, it's rather difficult to find a code that can deal with the whole entire metallicity range. And therefore we choose uh, an automatic call, uh, code called ATOS that uses like these temperature sensitive lines for the low metallicity end. And then uh, a code called SPACE for the higher metallicity end that measures basically iron lines and determines the temperature with this. Um, we compared also these codes and uh, we, uh, and for, for our sample that we just used here, uh, it was pretty consistent. What's very nice is uh, when you do everything basically again, you have a lot to compare with. You can compare with basically the whole literature that's already there. And here now we have the number of stars on the y-axis and the residual on the x-axis. So zero would be, we hit basically exactly the same abundance as, uh, as the literature uh, as well. But you can also see, so I just fitted the Gauss, Gaussian on, uh, on the differences on the residual. And you can also see that uh, for some elements, there are some systematics included, like for barium and so on. So they uh, exist. But now let's come a bit more to the physics. So I showed you this picture before without telling you that it's uh, the Trosferoidal Galaxy Sculptor that we uh, observed. And uh, to uh, to understand this picture, we can look at the, at, the, at the sketch of the galaxy basically here on the right, how the metals get enriched, uh, how the galaxy gets enriched in metals. And we can assume that the galaxy very simply first uh, consisted out of a gas cloud. From this gas cloud, some stars were formed and some of them we can still observe today, but others were dying in some events, enriching the gas cloud with metals again. That, uh, and then the gas cloud forms new stars. So instead of writing metallicity here on the x-axis, we can also write time on the x-axis. What's also interesting is the general shape of, uh, of these uh, stars, so of magnesium over iron versus metallicity, because this uh, shows a flat plateau at the beginning, which is caused by core collapse supernova at early times, and later type 1a set in, and they have a lower magnesium over iron ratio, and therefore the overall ratio decreases. So this point of the decrease happens, uh, happens uh, at around one giga year after the first star formation episode. 
But we did not only look at uh, sculpture, we also uh, analyzed other galaxies. So you can see here now exactly the same plot on the left at this we just looked at. But we also looked at Sagittarius, Fornax, uh, Ursa Minor, Sextans, and a bunch of other galaxies. And what's pretty interesting is if you look at this point of the decrease, which is at different metallicities for the, uh, for the individual systems. But I just told you that uh, it's approximately one giga year after the first star formation episode. And therefore, this point uh, tells you how well the galaxy was able to uh, maintain its metals or uh, how much metals it's also produced. And if you put this x value now uh, here on the y axis uh, and plotted versus absolute magnitude, you can see even the correlation uh, between the so called knee value uh, versus the absolute magnitude of the system. Another interesting thing that you can look at is this plateau value, because the plateau value should be sensitive to the progenitor mass of the Corcolab supernova, because you, uh, you expect different masses of Corcolab supernova produce a different magnesium over iron ratio. And therefore, this is the average, and therefore, it traces the initial mass function uh, of the Corcolab super, uh, of the stars, basically. Oh, sorry. Um, and this, uh, this plateau value is now here shown on the y axis. So it's a different y axis than here. Um, you can also see here on the y axis that uh, it's pretty, pretty narrow, and there's not really a correlation. So it seems to be rather universal across the different systems. So <clears throat> now that we know that, uh, that uh, the point of the knee uh, correlates with the magnitude, and I did not have time to talk about it, but uh, also the slope uh, correlates with the absolute magnitude, we can make an empirical relation and put other galaxies in uh, that where we only had a few stars measured. So for example, for LEO1, we only had two stars measured, and we just put it into this uh, empirical relation that I just said, and then we get the dashed line. And uh, apparently, it fits very well with also with these two stars. And what's even also interesting is, for example, a reticulum 2. Unfortunately, I had only two stars. Um, but I took uh, also literature values from Yi et al. And you can see that there was a low alpha star that has previously to be claimed already to have probably uh, a contribution of type 1a supernova. And if you put, uh, if you see where the line goes for reticulum here, this uh, Suyan line, uh, you will realize that uh, it also pretty much fits with this empirical relation. So this is very nice to know. But I introduced the talk with heavy elements and with the R process. And therefore, uh, let's look at europium over iron. So this is now, again, the same plot. But instead of magnesium here, we have europium. And in this plot, there are actually a couple of interesting things. For example, uh, reticulum 2 that I just talked about it uh, is at low metallicities extremely enhanced in europium. So this was already shown by Yi et al. in 2016. Uh, and it shows basically that this ultra enriched uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxies, together with other ultra faint dwarf galaxies that show no indication of neutron capture elements, uh, basically hints that uh, the R process host event has to be a rare event. Something else very interesting is this decreasing slope that you can see here. I will talk later in the talk about it. But unfortunately, you can also see that we have almost no measurements at the low metallicity end for europium. Therefore, so you can also see uh, uh, that the europium uh, spectral line vanishes for, for this star here, whereas the barium line is still fairly visible. So to solve this problem that we don't have europium measurements at low metallicities, it would be nice just to look at barium. However, barium in the sun is produced by, uh, dominantly by the S process. So the S process moves along stability here in the nuclear chart, whereas the R process uh, moves far from stability. But uh, uh, we can still use barium if we look at the europium over barium ratio, where we basically see the same structure. We have a plateau at the beginning, followed by a decrease at later metallicities. But this time, it's not caused by Corcolab supernova and uh, type 1a supernova, but by the R process at early times. 
and by the S process at late times that produce more barium than European. This is very nice because we can now define a quantity called barium R and just use barium at low metallicities where uh, the whole barium is produced by R process. And at higher metallicities, we still use europium and scale it somehow to, uh, to the barium scale by assuming that uh, both are produced in a, in a robust uh, ratio. So now that we have this quantity that traces the R process basically from low, very low metallicities to high metallicities, we can correlate it with an alpha element, uh, for example, magnesium. Why do we do this? Uh, we do this because magnesium is dominantly produced by coagulop supernovae, whereas barium is produced, uh, in, so this barium R should be produced in the R process. So now if we would have a slope of one here, uh, it would basically indicate that both elements are produced at the same time scales. So in other words, that the R process uh, is also produced in coagulop supernovae. You can see here now the result of a fit basically. Uh, with the slope here, and it's for Fornax, it's 1.2, for Sagittarius, 1.3, and for Sculptor, also around 1.2. So it's not exactly one, but we also knew Newton star mergers to exist. But what's very interesting is that for all systems, it's apparently more or less the same within the arrow. So this alone could already be an indication that uh, Coccolab supernova could also be responsible for a part of our process elements. Another indication we can get uh, by this decreasing slope that I uh, showed it, uh, it early, uh, early in the talk. And this decreasing slope you can also see in the Milky Way. And here's a plot from uh, a paper of Benoit Coté in 2019, um, where he uh, shows this decreasing slope for some stars in the Milky Way. And uh, however, when you try to model europium over iron, there's uh, the so-called delay time distribution that goes in that you can infer from some observations. And a reasonable value to take is t to the minus one for Newton star mergers, but also t to the minus one for type 1a supernova. But if you put this in uh, into your models, uh, regardless of the complexity of the model, you're not able to describe this decreasing trend uh, that has been observed. A possible solution uh, to this problem would be an additional source uh, of R process elements at early time uh, that produce a lot of europium, for example. Um, one of these sources could be magnetorotational driven supernova. And therefore, in the second part of my PhD, I dealt exactly with these kind of events. And for this, I took a simulation from, performed by Martin Obergaulinger and Miguel Angel Deloy. And it's uh, the first simulation that was uh, simulated for a long time in the order of seconds, and also uh, included a sophisticated neutrino, transport, uh, neutrino treatment. It was calculated in 2D, uh, and it had a parameterized magnetic field. However, these simulations are pretty expensive, so it's not possible to calculate uh, also the nuclear synthesis within the simulation itself. And therefore, my task was uh, to answer the question if these events are able to synthesize heavy elements. So before going further, uh, I said uh, it's a 2D simulation. What, this, uh, what does this actually mean? So you can see that here always only half of it is shown. You can see here on the left that you have to, uh, to think about like these plots, like in this uh, right shape here, uh, where you have a rotation axis around the set axis, a symmetry axis around the set axis, whereas a full 3D simulation would more look like the left side here. So <clears throat> let's talk about the models that we uh, analyzed. And uh, we had four models where the magnetic field was artificially varied. And uh, the first model was the RO model, where the O stands for ordinary, uh, which simply means that the uh, magnetic field was taken from the progenitor. Uh, then we have a weakened magnetic field indicated by the v, uh, W, and uh, we have a stronger magnetic field and one model with an enhanced rotation rate. You can see here on the left the result uh, with mass fractions versus mass number. And you can see that for the model with the strong magnetic field, 
uh, we synthesize everything up to the third R process peak. So we have a, an R process going on there. And uh, then for, for our reference model, the ordinary model, uh, we basically have something around iron with a, big, uh, with a bit of heavier elements. So pretty much what you would expect from a usual core collapse supernova. And with an enhanced rotation rate, uh, we have less heavy elements here. So to summarize, uh, magnetic fields favor the conditions for heavy elements while rotation seems to act against it. So uh, before I showed you the, the integrated pattern, but we, you can also look at individual fluid elements in this simulation. And now we have basically uh, the same plot as before, but now for every individual fluid, elements here, uh, fluid element here on the left. So each line is uh, one of the calculations. And you can actually see that these different fluid elements synthesize uh, elements that are pretty similar to each other within different groups. And these different groups uh, arise from the magic numbers in the nuclear chart that act as bottlenecks for, uh, for the nuclear synthesis flow in the nuclear chart. So <clears throat> to uh, make it more visible, uh, these are the, the different groups that I'm currently talking about. So we made these groups based on the k-means clustering al algorithm on the uh, abundances. Uh, but it's actually very good to look uh, also at the entropy electron fraction plane. Um, so here, first of all, I have to explain the, uh, the electron fraction, which is the amount of protons uh, versus the amount of baryons. Or in other words, with decreasing electron fraction, you have an increasing amount of neutrons. So even when we made the groups based on uh, the final nucleosynthetic pattern, you can also see uh, that we basically made our groups also in this electron fraction plane, uh, where we have really sharp cuts here, um, which shows the, uh, the importance of this parameter on the final nucleosynthetic result. What's also interesting to see is that the model with the strong magnetic field that we we're just looking at uh, favors the condition for neutron-rich material, but on the other hand, also has some proton-rich ejector uh, uh, getting ejected. Um, now we can also look at all the models, and we can see that it's also uh, that this is also the reason that we don't get so heavy elements that we just ha don't have the uh, neutron-rich ejector uh, in the other models. But uh, apparently we can this investigate why this is the case. So uh, to look at this, we can also look at the, uh, the density versus the temperature. So the maximum density of the fluid element versus the maximum temperature. And now each dot here in this plot uh, is one fluid element. And you can see that some of the fluid elements get very, very dense. So in other words, it's basically a proton neutron star material. It's a very neutron rich material that gets ejected. But on the other hand, you also have neutrinos. Uh, and with neutrinos, you can react uh, from protons to neutrons or the other way. And if you irradiate a certain fluid element uh, for infinitely long, you will obtain uh, an equilibrium value that is given by this formula. And if you take a typical uh, fluid element from the model of the strong magnetic field, uh, this value will be around 0.45 to 0.65, so much higher than, uh, than the YE that we use to uh, produce a full R process. So the solution to this is that basically we need fluid elements that get ejected very, very fast. So here's now the average radius versus the time. And you can see that uh, for the fluid elements that uh, synthesize elements up to the third R process peak, um, they go very deep and then getting ejected very, very fast. So in other words, they escape the neutrinos uh, very fast. And therefore, it's possible to maintain the neutron richness to synthesize these elements. So we can also look at the spatial distribution of the fluid elements. So now here on the left, we have in the upper panel, we have the electron fraction given by the simulation. And below, uh, it's the ejected material color coded. So where darker colors indicate more mass. And uh, each panel is one of the different groups. So you can see right at the beginning that the lower panel with the R process group uh, basically does not show any mass at all, uh, which is caused that it's uh, 
located pretty much in the center. So we do not see it now. But if I start the movie, you can see something, namely, uh, so now the blue line is the shock front. And you can see that right at the beginning, uh, this material gets ejected. And uh, what we also basically saw before. But when I continue with the movie, also the, the other groups uh, fall, fall in and get ejected. And uh, uh, these two groups, so the upper two groups, are basically progenitor material that just gets slightly shocked and driven by the shock outwards. And at this point, you can see that the neutral mat rich material is located in the cocoon around the jet, whereas the jet itself, the center of the jet itself, is proton rich. And we can continue. And then towards the end of the simulation, um, uh, all these troops are still ejected. Uh, this one not, so the, the most neutron rich not. And uh, the progenitor material also gets ejected until the end of the simulation. So why does this not happen in, uh, in the other models? So for this, we can look at, uh, at two movies provided by Martin Obergaulinger. And uh, we have like the, the reference model here on the left. And if we look at the explosion, you can see that the shock stalls at some point and it needs some time to explode. Whereas if we look at the model with the strong magnetic field, uh, the picture is slightly different. So because it basically explodes immediately. So uh, this is the reason that basically in the, in the left model, in the reference model, there's no ejector uh, that uh, reaches these uh, neutron rich conditions compared to the model of the strong magnetic field. So, but this story cannot be completely true because uh, I was not talking at the beginning about the model with the weak magnetic field. So weak here means apparently it's even weaker than the model, than the reference model. And, but apparently it synthesizes elements up to the second R process peak, so more than our reference model, so heavier elements. We investigated this and in order to investigate this, it's, uh, uh, it's nice to look at these kind of plots. Uh, where we have the time when the fluid elements hits 5.8 gigakelvin, so when it drops out of nuclear statistical equilibrium, versus the ejection angle here on the x-axis. So here for the model with the strong magnetic field, you can see that uh, the very neutron-rich material is ejected right at the beginning, and later there's basically nothing ejected anymore, whereas the, the fluid elements that synthesize elements up to the second R process peak are ejected towards uh, still at the end of the simulation. Um, on the other hand, when we look at the model with the weak magnetic field, you see a different picture. So all the material that synthesizes the second R process peak is ejected right at the end of the simulation, so right before the simulation stops. And uh, this can be explained by looking at the center of the star, basically. Uh, now we have here color-coded the electron fraction at uh, 1.4 seconds. And you can see here in blue the proton neutron star, the very neutron rich proton neutron star. And you can see at early times it has a, a rather spherical shape. Whereas if you look at 2.2 seconds, you can see that the neutron star kind of popped out and has an O-plate shape. So here, once again, remember that uh, the set axis is basically the symmetry axis, and therefore you can say it's an O-plate shape. Um, and this uh, Change of the shape is caused by angular momentum transport of the magnetic field to the outer layers of the star. And basically when, uh, when this shape happens, uh, when this change of the shape happens, uh, neutron rich material gets ejected. And uh, therefore we have this neutron rich material here in the ejector uh, at the very, very end. So, but this also shows that long time simulations are crucial to catch all nucleosynthetic features in these kind of events. So now that we have analyzed the events, we can also compare it to observations. And uh, there, there are supernova observed that are very, very energetic, so-called hypernova. And we can just put our models into this picture. And uh, you can see that the models do not quite reach the explosion energies needed to explain hypernova. 
but apparently also the explosion energy is not saturated in the uh, simulations. So if you would simulate further, the explosion energy would still grow. So this is more to be seen as a lower limit uh, in this plot. The same holds for the ejected nickel mass. Uh, also here, nickel is still ejected until the end of the simulation. And uh, this is a lower limit. Uh, but apparently, these values are currently not enough to explain this hypernova branch. Another interesting thing that you can compare to observations uh, comes from uh, the analysis of meteorites. And I don't want to go into detail, uh, but apparently it has been shown in, in this paper from Bernard Crotet in 2020 that uh, you can measure this iodine-129 to curium-247 ratio. And um, curium-247 is quite heavy, so we can only compare it to the model of the strong magnetic field. But apparently, if, uh, if you look at the ratios, they're like way up from this plot. And the reason for this is that uh, the model is simply not neutron rich enough to uh, synthesize enough curium. You can see this if we look at the nuclear chart and just compare one of the most, so one of the more neutron rich uh, fluid elements of this model uh, and compare it, for example, with this uh, NSNSR model. Uh, which is much more neutron rich and also synthesizes curium compared uh, to the model with the strong magnetic field that we investigate. So in other words, this model would not be able to explain uh, these ratios. What's also interesting is to look at the gamma rays. So when a nucleus decays, it can uh, emit photons and uh, these will give a certain signature. And we can show the flux here versus the energy of the photons. And um, yeah, so after different times, so each panel is a different time. So it's one minute, one hour, up to 100 years. And it's apparently pretty interesting because uh, there are spectra of the afterglow of gamma ray bursts. And for example, after a very short time, uh, they measured like a peculiar bump here. Uh, which they speculate to be uh, a nickel line. And apparently also this model, so this is also again for the model with the strong magnetic field, by the way. Um, and also this model shows uh, like nickel emission lines at approximately uh, this energy. So I have to say that, uh, that this plot here on the left is very simplified because we do not have any transport or something. It's just really emission of photons by the decay of nuclei. So it's not even absorption or nothing. Um, yeah, but still. Uh, so it's, it's a bit speculative to say, uh, so they also only speculate that this could be a nickel line because after such a, uh, such a low time, the, the matter is still very fast and therefore there's a lot of Doppler broadening. Uh, but apparently it might be a nickel line uh, that we also see. What's also interesting uh, is this titanium feature that you can see clearly here still after 100 years. And this was also measured, for example, in supernova 1987A or in Cas A, so Cassiopeia A. You can see here the spectrum of these clear measured uh, two emission lines. What's also very, very interesting is uh, this cesium-137 line. And this is interesting because it's a heavy element. So if you would uh, observe such a heavy element, it would directly indicate, uh, and it's radioactive. So it would directly indicate that the event uh, would have produced these kind of heavy elements. So it would be a direct observation uh, of the R process. And if you put the flux that you would expect from this cesium-137 uh, here into a color code, uh, in a figure, figure uh, time versus distance. And you can also put like uh, a dashed line, what you would expect uh, to, to be able to be measured here in, uh, in the figure. So from uh, yeah, what, what you may expect to, to, what you are able to be measured. Uh, so, and apparently uh, this tells you that the event should be closer than approximately three uh, kiloparsec which would be very, very close. So uh, it's actually pretty hard to detect uh, heavy elements in uh, these kind of events. 
You can also compare uh, two stars. So here now we have uh, the Sneden star, for example, that shows uh, a very robust R process pattern. Then we have the solar system R process abundances here shown as black line. And we have a couple of other stars, so-called Honda stars, that show a decreasing pattern uh, with increasing atomic number. So now we put our model with strong magnetic field in and we normalize it to strontium here. And we can see that also this model shows like more this decreasing uh, pattern that you observe in Honda stars rather than in, uh, in the Sneden star and other metal poor stars. Yeah. Um, what's also very interesting to come back to the beginning of the talk is if we put uh, the ejected material in this uh, square bracket notation again. So we have europium over iron. And uh, for this event, we, we get an europium over iron that is this horizontal line here. And uh, now if we assume uh, that uh, we mix in this material into a certain amount of hydrogen, uh, we can also determine the metallicity then uh, that we would expect from this event only. And uh, then we would end up at these, uh, at these points from the, uh, where the diagonal lines are shown uh, for the different masses. If we make a last assumption, namely that uh, the dwarf galaxy is enriched by only one event and we can describe it by only one event, you're basically left with reticulum two in this picture. Um, and the diagonal lines show, uh, so basically we have only points from this event, but if we allow for further iron, either because this is a lower limit here in the simulation or because of other Corcolob supernova also contribute uh, to the amount of iron, we would move along these diagonal lines. So in other words, uh, if this model would be responsible for the enrichment of reticulum two, Reticulum two should have uh, a mass of around 10 to the five solar masses. And there are theoretical estimates of the mass of reticulum two, which are around 2.4 times 10 to the five solar masses, uh, solar masses. So it's approximately in the same order of magnitude. So indeed this event could explain such an enrichment as well. So to summarize, at the beginning I showed you uh, in the first, uh, Part of my talk, I showed you uh, the largest homo uh, homogeneous high resolution study of dwarf spheroidal galaxies that have been carried out so far. So, in, we investigated first the evolution of lighter elements to learn more about the systems uh, itself. And then later, we investigated heavier elements to learn more about the R process. We showed that the R process uh, uh, with respect to alpha elements do not show any dependence on the luminosity or mass of the system which may be a hint towards rare crocolip supernova also contributing to R process elements. In the second part of my talk, I showed you uh, the nucleosynthesis of magnetorotational driven supernova, uh, which may be a possible host event of the R process. We showed that uh, the uh, long-time simulations are pretty important to catch all relevant nucleosynthetic fingerprints. And uh, we, we're also able to detect an R process if you make the magnetic field strong enough. Uh, but these events also on the same, uh, these events also uh, include proton rich conditions. And uh, in the end of my talk, uh, we investigated possible observables uh, connected to these kind of events. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for a great talk, Moritz. Uh, really interesting work. Uh, so questions, you can unmute and uh, start asking Moritz. Okay, I can start with the first question. <laughs> uh, can you go to the, the slide where you're showing the spatial distribution of the ejecta? Yes. Yeah. 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 So if I understand correctly, the really R, the R process stuff is just getting kind of protected from the jet, 
right? Uh, what do you mean? So the R process uh, group, so the last one, when it gets outside from the shockwave, it kind of gets, it's on the, you said it's in the cocoon, right? Yeah, it's in the cocoon, but it's still yes. inside the shockwave. But uh, so like uh, located on a cocoon around the jet, more or less. Right. So in the model, there's no like mixing between the material of the R process and other stuff. Uh, there is slight mixing, so. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't affect the distribution of the elements. So this is actually a tricky question because uh, so when you post-process the nucleosynthesis, you have basically these fluid elements and you make a one zone model. Uh, so you assume basically a one zone model, which means that all the fluid elements are separated from each other. Mm -hmm. So in the nucleosynthesis calculation, it's not allowed that they mix, basically. Right. But in the simulation, they could. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure okay. how much this happens. I've not checked. I mean, it seems that there is no mixing here because it's kind of protected, like shielded. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So it's not well mixed for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Always a bad sign if no one has a question, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, Fried uh, Friedel Kielmann, just a short question. Uh, what you showed on this one slide that you typically eject about 10 to the minus two solar masses of nickel. Yeah. Kind of varying between a few times 10 to the minus three and a few times 10 to the minus two, but the average is about independent of the magnetic fields around 10 to the minus two. Huh? Yeah, the, the problem with this is, uh, so I said also that it's a lower limit and apparently mm -hmm. the model with the weak magnetic field ejects the most nickel, but this is more or less caused that this was run for the longest time, more or less. So if you would run mm -hmm. the others for longer times, I would also expect to have uh, higher nickel masses. So this is like well, would you a lower expect limit. how high it can go? I honestly did not calculate this and I'm not sure how high it can go. It could probably, I just guessed that it could reach the hypernova branch, but I'm not sure. And, and the one model where you actually had a relatively strong R process produces a couple of 10 to the minus six solar masses of europium. Huh? Yes. So five yes, times uh, 10 to the minus six. You ha do you have a, okay, you have shown models with different magnetic fields. So this is the one model which gets you up to the third R process peak. Yeah. yeah. So there was only so one, one model. So have everything below. Yeah, the other ones are like in the region of 10 to the minus 12 or something like this, or even okay. lower. So the only one that also could reach something, uh, so like a non-negligible value is the RW model, but also there it's like very, very, very low. So Thank you. Okay, more questions from Moritz. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Sorry. Okay. So I'm Anne Cecilia. Um, first, uh, it was a great talk. Uh, thanks so much. This was very interesting. Uh, I I have a question which is maybe a bit on the side. Um, but I'm always a bit puzzled when uh, people claim that uh, galactic chemical evolution models can't, uh, or it, it, uh, they support that there is also some additional R processing from yeah. other uh, sources that are not neutron star mergers. Um, it's just that, uh, well, right now I have, I found two papers from 2015 where they show that it's perfectly fine to just use neutron star mergers, even um, for the very early. So this is- Yes, uh, for the very early, but- uh, So it's- Yes, there's, uh, there's a lot of discussion about it, but uh, if you look at this plot, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it more deals with the metal rich end. So it really deals with the decrease. Mm. And I'm not sure if anyone has shown that if you I mean, for sure, there are also speculations of other uh, delay time distributions for neutron star mergers, like t to the minus 1.5. And then you would also be able to possibly uh, get this decrease. But uh, 
So T tilde minus one is very reasonable, but of course there are other explanations to, to actually get the decrease. But one of them is uh, uh, an additional burst of europium at the beginning, if it's from neutral star merger or not, uh, no one can tell. But also uh, magnetorotational driven supernova could be an interesting source. And mm -hmm. apparently in this paper, um, they also calculated the res residual europium that would be necessary uh, to describe uh, this decrease. And uh, if you calculate this residual, uh, it also shows you that you need like a source that is active at early times and fades away later. And magnetorotational driven supernova uh, fit perfectly there because you would also expect to fade them kind of away because with increasing metallicities, you have more mass loss and therefore decreased rotation rates. And mm. therefore uh, they would be not rotating possibly not rotating fast enough uh, anymore. And therefore they are probably more often, but this is very speculative, probably more often in the mm. early universe. Mm. Okay, yeah. Um, just uh, this Aries model, for example, uh, it, it looks perfect. Yeah, it yeah, there's a lot of discussion. The neutral star mergers. So, so yeah, um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> I guess yeah, it's I mean, an it's, open question. Yeah, yeah, sure, it's an open question. It's not the solution. <laughs> For sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Cecil. Uh, more questions for Moritz? Hi. Hi. Hi, Kenneth. Uh, yes. Uh, do you find any uh, correlation or relationship between the nickel 56 ejector and our process mass uh, and, and exposure energy? Yeah. I uh, haven't looked at this. Mm -hmm. So you mean the the, the explosion <coughs> yeah, so, energy yeah. and the nickel? Yeah, uh, no, post, sorry, our process mass. <coughs> uh, it's Eject, ejector mass, our process and I am um, It's apparently quite hard to do because mm. we don't have the final nickel mass, so we can. Oh yeah, really tell. yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and therefore, it does not even correlate with the magnetic field. And uh, yeah, yeah. so I think it's pretty difficult to correlate this with the ejected mass. And, uh, and uh, we haven't looked at it. Sorry, I, I want to ask you that uh, between Nikkei 56 to and R process material. Yeah, I mean, the R process material is more or less, mm -hmm. I mean, it's similar. It's, it's even still ejected in the model with the strong magnetic field uh -huh, I see. Uh, in the end of the uh -huh. simulation. But nickel is ejected still at the end of the simulation in all models. So I think it will be mm. pretty hard to make any correlation there. So you have to make kind of an estimate what would be the final nickel mass that you would expect. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you focus on the uh, so heavy arc element is around produces third peak. I think they, in my understanding, they ejected promptly. So rate of phase contribution is around up to the second peak. So in that sense, I could, I think I, you could do, uh, find the analysis, but, but I guess you, <laughs> your case, this is not much. But models for yeah, can mean, produce that's, that's, peak, but only one yeah, case. Yeah. It's only one model that produces yeah. the third peak. So. <laughs> we would have yeah, just, yeah, yeah, simply I, I expect that the case, the, the case very, uh, very heavy Arbus elements are produced. Maybe possibly nickel can be decreased, uh, but I'm not sure. Possibly. Yeah, one could look very, at very energetic case. Can, can I eject the boss? Well, so I have no yeah. idea. It would actually be interesting to first of mm. all calculate a nickel mass that is yeah. like reliable and then possibly correlate it with this. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, any more questions? There's also discussion about the European and the GC papers on the chat if you want to take a look uh, in some references. I don't know how I opened the chat, honestly, but uh, oh, it's on the bottom. We'll be able to do in a minute, probably. If you stop sharing your screen, maybe. Mm. Yeah, probably. Yeah, let's wait to another question.
Any more questions for uh, Moritz? Can unmute yourself and speak. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, so more you, now we're going from one paper of Benoit to another one. Um, so on page 30, you have this, uh, the iodine and, uh, can you show that page 30? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. So here there's also another Magnum rotation driven supernova model. Yeah. Um, and this one has a much lower uh, ratio than the one you calculate. So can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, so this is the model from, uh, so first of all, I, I'm not in any case related to this paper, but uh, I know that this is the model from Winterla in 2012, uh, which is a bit more neutron rich, also because they have a different neutrino treatment. Um, and I'm not sure, I think the magnetic field is possibly in the same order of magnitude. I'm not sure about this, um, but uh, alone due, uh, due to the neutrino treatment, uh, they get more neutron rich material than in our models. Okay. So, and therefore they synthesize more of curium and therefore the ratio is lower. But also compared to the other models, it's still a bit more uh, proton rich than, than they are. So less neutron rich. That's right. Okay, I think we might have time for one more question. Anyone? Oh yeah, we have a hand, please. Uh, for Kawasan. Um, may I ask a question about protein to mass of supernovae? Yeah, sure. Um, is there any re specific reasons for choosing 35 um, solar mass? Um, so this is the zero H main sequence uh, mass, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's kind of arbitrary, but uh, there are also other studies that use uh, lower mass progenitors. So it's, I think an arbitrary choice of, of mass, but it has to be higher than a certain mass to even make a coccolob supernova. Um, does it strongly affect your result by changing the mass of um, supernovae? I guess by changing the progenitor, it affects the result, but uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on this because the hydro was actually performed by uh, Martin Obergaulinger and Miguel Angel. And so therefore I'm not sure, but if you make the magnetic field strong enough, I would still say that you would see some uh, process material, but uh, Unfortunately, we only had studied this one progenitor. Therefore, now it's hard to tell for me. Um, but also other studies get similar results with other progenitors. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, we have one more hand uh, from Nicole, yes. Hi, Moritz. Very nice Hi. talk. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned in the beginning that this new MHD simulation has more sophisticated neutrino treatment. Yes. Could you briefly just mention just maybe one or two differences between their neutrino treatment and the Winteller, how it evolved? Um, so the Winteller is basically uh, just a simple leakage scheme, as far as I remember. But uh, what Martin used is uh, the M1 scheme. Uh, so which basically approximate the, the transport. And this scheme tends to be uh, produce results that are as a tendency more proton rich, as you see. And um, so in Vintela, they, they were also aware of it and they made some corrections on the YE in the end, I think, uh, and played a bit around. But with this neutrino treatment that we are using now in one, um, we don't have to play so much with uh, with the luminosities itself. They're really uh, quite sophisticated. So it's not a full belt Boltzmann transport, but uh, it's approximated also as well. So they do go all the way to M1, not just M0. Okay, that's interesting. 
but again okay. here i'm also not the expert because i was not the person <laughs> simulating oh uh, yeah I, thanks okay uh any other questions still some discussion in the chat about the GC models. Hey, Maurice, this is Panos. Yeah, Panos. So in the first part of the, of the talk, you, you saw some things about uh, European Embarium, their abundances. Yeah. Uh, do you know why there are not data for European in very low metallicities? Uh, yes, actually, I think ah, here you can basically see it. So I mean, okay, this is not uh, representative, but also in the in the blue, there's another European line, but they vanish at some point. So simply the absorption line goes into noise. That's the way it's it's, too far, yeah. yeah, but but barium on the other hand has like this very strong absorption line. Therefore, you have like also barium at the low metallicity end. So this is, by the way, the same star. It's the same star. Okay. So on the left and on the right. Okay, uh, I think we're almost done. I don't see any other hands. In case you want to ask something more, you can do it now. Last call. Okay, I guess that's it for today. Uh, so thanks again, Moritz, for giving this great talk. And okay, there's a question. No. Oh, time to see. Okay. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday and uh, uh, I wish you a nice, uh, pleasant uh, weekend. Thank you. Cheers and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice.